So I am genuinely so excited that today's guest is on the guest list. Look at the size of that smile because um, she's the guest that I wanted to be on the podcast before we even started putting together a list of people for the podcast. Um, I pretty much hounded her on Instagram. <laughs> to come on. Um, So today's guest has been on our TV screens for a number of different reasons, Um, but more recently she received international acclaim for her documentary, Unmasking My Autism. Um, She's received international acclaim, she's been nominated for awards, and the National Autistic Society shared how incredibly brave she was to share her personal experience. After watching the documentary, I felt the need to go on Instagram and message this person individually just to say thanks for teaching me so much about autism and I really hope that if every healthcare professional watched this documentary I think it would make a big difference to people out there who particularly those who have undiagnosed autism, especially girls and women. So you've probably guessed who it is. It's um, so lucky to have her here. It's Christine McGuinness. Thank you. Thank you. That was an amazing intro. (laughs) Well, it's from the heart, as you can tell. I feel quite emotional. Um, But I'm so lucky to have you here, Christine. And I really, honestly, I'm a bit nervous about you. I'm more nervous about interviewing you than I have been about anybody else, because I just think you're such an incredible woman, um, everything that you do, how brave you are. You have three autistic children, you're autistic yourself, you have ADHD and you know, I just really admire you. So thank you for oh, being here. Thank you. No, thanks for having me. I think it's important and you know, coming from a doctor to say I've taught you something is uh, it's pretty pretty amazing. Well that's what this podcast is about, you know, as doctors I think people sometimes assume we know everything and we know a lot, but we don't know what it's like to live with these conditions or to live with disorders or to live with neurodivergence. I'm not even sure we should call it a disorder, but we'll get into that. The first question I want to ask you is, what is the one thing you should never say to somebody who is neurodivergent? Um, I think, I'm sure this answer would be different from everybody, but for me personally, it's, it's one that I get all the time. When you say that you're autistic or you've got autistic children, People go, oh, I think we're all a bit on the spectrum. Right. That for me is is the one thing that I don't like to hear. Just because I think they're saying it to try and make you feel normal, yeah. whatever that is, yeah. to try and make you feel like it's it's not too different and you're just like us. And but it it also dismisses that you know all of the assessments, all of the time, all of the challenges, all of the struggles, things what people don't see. It, it's kind of pushes that down. Everything what we've gone through as a family, as a mother, as a carer, me, myself, it it sort of shuts that away as though, oh, you're just just like us, we're we're all a bit on the spectrum. It's kind of like, no, you're not. There are neurotypical people and there are neurodiverse people and they are completely different. And we we very much know that the world is set up and designed for neurotypical people to thrive. What, maybe you can paint a bit of a picture for us. So um, what has your day been like so far? today um maybe you can talk us through it a little bit and and maybe how do you think your day has been different to somebody who is neurotypical having both autism and adhd um so today i I try to praise myself and recognize how far i've come with things now i try and do that more often um and i woke up in a different hotel that i hadn't stayed in before and I kind of thought, okay, that was, I didn't sleep brilliant, but I don't sleep amazing anyway. I, I also have insomnia. Um, but I was like, no, I've, I've done it because in the past, I would only ever stay in one particular hotel where I, I knew what it was like. I was comfortable. Mm-hmm. I knew what pictures were going to be on the walls, what the, what the curtains looked like. And I, I like things to be the same. Everything was very white. So for years, I would only stay in one hotel. Now, the last, the last two years, I've been trying to stay more in different places so that the location's closer to wherever I'm working that day. And so first thing this morning, I thought, okay, woke up, I, I slept fine, I'm safe, I'm, and I've done it again. I've, I've smashed it, I've stayed in a different hotel. Yeah. Um, then I ordered breakfast. And I know how particular I am with food. Again, this is down to my autism. It's nothing to do with body weight or image. It's It's sensory for me. I like everything to be beige and dry and 
again still trying to stay positive I was thinking okay it, it's not going to be the exact toast with the exact butter that I like and it's not going to be delivered as I would do it myself at home but I'm in a hotel I'm trying to deal with changes so I'll just order some scrambled egg on toast and a cup of tea and I'll just it'll be fine and then breakfast came. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> it? It was scrambled egg on toast, but it was it was on this sourdough bread, which has got a lot more going on than just normal toast. And then the eggs were orange and not yellow. Mm. And that took me forever to get my head around. I kind of sat there looking at this plate of scrambled egg on toast, thinking, how can it be so different to what I have every day? Like it was, it was a complete different color, different smell, different texture. And even though I, I know myself that it's it's kind of all in my head that it's so different and it will probably taste the same, I just couldn't bring myself to to try it. Mm. I just kind of was like, I can't do it. And it, it frustrates me, things like that really frustrate me that I can't just get my head around it and just, just try it. I don't know what I'm scared of with it. So what did you, did you order something else or... So I've got got a croissant because they're just usually the same everywhere. So that's a safer option. Yeah, I remember, I don't know if it was on another podcast. um, And I remember you talking about taking your children to McDonald's. It's like a little treat. It's something you do every week. And oh, that was right. You'd been on your first holiday, I think. Yeah. And there was a McDonald's. Yeah. And that was, you know, for your children and for you, you know, that was, because McDonald's, wherever you go in the world, it's the same food. The same. It looks the same. It tastes the same. It's familiar. The smells are the same. Yeah. And um, so that was like your It's really common for, for autistic people, for autistic children and adults to mm-hmm. really enjoy a McDonald's because it's the fami- familiarity. It's, yeah. it's the same everywhere you go in the world. That little red box, it's yeah. the same symbol and they usually taste the same. Um, so yeah, again, it's it's not it's not that our children just love fast food at the weekend. It's it's that it's safe for them. They know what it's going to taste like, and it's not scary for them. Yeah, and you you say you know I think that's another thing that is misunderstood. You talk about it in the documentary that you did experience an eating disorder, um, but that wasn't triggered by wanting to be a certain body t- type or body no. shape or. You know, it was actually the the experience of going to secondary school. Yeah, the school canteen. School canteen, because you very highly, your senses are very highly charged as well. So the noises, um, the environment. Yeah. I think it's scary for anyone actually, school canteen, but if you have autism. And then the foods as well, because you are particular about which foods you yeah. want to eat. So therefore you, you didn't eat for those reasons. And then that, um, and then that, that ended escalated up, into yeah, a eating which, disorder. Yeah, which took years to get over. But once I understood it and I understood my reasons why I wasn't eating, it was because I was always being encouraged to eat foods that for me are not considered safe foods. So, mm-hmm. I'd, you know, of course I was under a doctor, I was under a dietitian, I, I seen a nutritionalist and they would always say, you know, you can eat whatever you want. If it's healthy, you can have your carrots, you can, you can have vegetables, you can have cucumber and you'll never put weight on. And I remember sitting there just, I, I wouldn't vocalise it. Mm-hmm. I, and that's part of the problem. I wouldn't say, but it's it's not that. I'm not worried about my weight. It's because it's, it's green and it's orange and it's got every colour of the rainbow and it's all these different textures and I don't know what it's going to taste like and it smells too much for me. And yeah, it, there was there was a lot. And once I understood it, I've been a lot better. Now yeah. I know where I'm comfortable. I'll push myself more now than ever because of the yeah. children. Yeah. But it's, you know, I've, I've learned from it and it's become a positive because when I took my children to school, one of the first things I, I spoke to the headmaster about was them eating in the canteen. If they didn't want to, if they couldn't cope with it, you know, can you please provide a place for them that's quiet so that they will eat because I don't want my children to be yeah. going without food all day. Yeah. And I was very, very fortunate that we've got a supportive school that allowed that to happen. And it's taken a couple of years for them to be eating on their own to then slowly mix them with a group. And now they do go into the canteen when it's quieter. But that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have had that bad yeah. experience at school myself. So do you, do you we're kind of, well, I'm gonna ask you the questions we've planned, but I'm just going a bit out of order because that just leads me into, do you think that, obviously you didn't know you were autistic when you had your children. Um, and it was in the process of them getting their diagnosis that it came to light that, you know, yeah. actually when you're looking at the assessments and doing the questionnaires, um, it became apparent that, that you had autism yourself. Do you think that having autism has helped you parent autistic children? 
Yeah, definitely. And I do because we're all very similar, obviously. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's kind of why I didn't even know they were autistic at first. You know, I, I didn't know much about autism before the children were diagnosed, even being autistic myself. I always felt different, but I didn't know what or why. I just thought, you know, like like everyone had told me growing up, my teachers, family, oh, she's she's unsocial, she's just shy, or, you know, sometimes come off a, a, a bit rude because I wouldn't mix with people. Um, so I didn't understand why I was like that. And when my children were just the same, I thought, well, it's, it's, obviously they're just a bit like me, but I, I didn't realize that was because we're all autistic. And now, knowing everything that I know, I think knowledge is definitely power and it's key to improvement for all of us. I'll, I'll push us, I'll push us all when it comes to socialising, when it comes to trying different foods, when it, when it comes to going to different places, I'll, I'll push us all, but not too much to where it's gonna, you know, tip us all over and yeah. trigger a meltdown. And then that sends us 10 steps back. Well, I guess that's, that's the power in knowledge, isn't it? Because you can, you know what feels safe and what feels comfortable and you know why that feels safe and comfortable. And once you have your kind of like safety circle, you can push boundaries a little bit because you yeah. know you can just step back into the yeah. safety of the circle if that makes sense kind of as and when you need to so you can yeah. sort of push different and I, and I know my children like any parent does I know them and, and I recognize when things are getting too much for them so I know to step back um but they're doing incredibly well and I think it's yeah it's it's a mixture of me understanding being autistic and also them having a good support system at school and and that's how you managed to go on holiday. Was it your first family holiday? Yeah, you yeah. Were, you and the children. You went yeah. on a plane and stayed yeah. in a hotel. And cause that's so much change. That's so much. You know, yeah. the noise of being on a on a plane. And how how was it? It was it was amazing. They'd done incredibly well. It took a lot of prep. Mm -hmm. um, we'd flown with them years ago. It was before lockdown, but just to Southampton, and that was kind of like a trial right. flight. We just thought if it goes terrible, then at least we can get a car back if if we need to. So we'd done that to start with, and then the plan was to go away, but lockdown happened. Um, and then after that, it, it just took a long time for them to get comfortable going back out and about again. Um, regression is, is quite common in autistic people. Mm -hmm. um, so that happened. And yeah, it's it's been months of visiting the airport, watching airplanes, going with the rear defenders on and then slowly removing them so that they can get used to the noise and watching a lot of videos um, to the point where they were, they were happy and excited about it and not scared. And there were still moments where you know, we kind of had to take one each and, and make sure they were nice and calm. Yeah. And um, they they done well. they done really, really well. As so, yeah, you. hopefully more holidays. Yeah, amazing. So we know in your documentary, you really did shine a light on autism, especially how it presents differently in women and girls and therefore it's not diagnosed. But I think an area that we've heard less about is is ADHD and you've also fairly recently received a diagnosis of that haven't you yeah how's the, how did that come to light so it's quite common to get a double diagnosis when you're autistic you could potentially be autistic and ADHD or autistic and dyspraxic or dyslexic it is quite common to get that double barrel um for me the ADHD is something I didn't understand how I could be ADHD because again you, you google or you see people and you have this image of what you think ADHD is going to be like and I didn't fit in that bracket but then when I researched it properly spoke to a doctor I am a different type of ADHD and I'm an inattentive ADHD which is different to the typical hyperactive ADHD person that you might see and recognize more often so for me where I'm inattentive it's it's very much more um can be quite distant do kind of live in my own little bubble quite a lot. Um, it, it goes it goes quite naturally with my autism. It's kind of, it does overlap, it's quite similar. Um, but then I have my moments where I am extremely hyperactive in, in my thoughts, in my creative side, in my feelings, in my emotions. Mm. Um, I will be extremely hyper emotional if I'm sad. It can be the end of the world to the point where I'll think, I, I can't cope, I can't do this anymore. Even having suicidal thoughts, it can go that far. And that's where the, the hyper side for me is. Um, right. But then also on the plus side, if, if I'm happy, it, it's it's the best thing in the world and yeah. nothing can ruin my day and it can be from the tiniest little thing. Um, and that's where the, the ADHD affects me. But if, if you met someone with ADHD or spoke to somebody about it, they might assume that 
you're hyper and you you're all over the place and you're full of energy and and all of this and and that's not the the type of ADHD that I am. I think well this is this is a lot of the the issue I think certainly within within healthcare services um, and and this is the thing that really struck me when I watched your documentary and there were certain parts in that documentary where you had guests on there as well and you know they hadn't especially as girls and women we're taught in medical school we're always taught, taught the stereotype so we are taught ADHD I mean it's quite a while that since I was at medical school and I'm sure it's improved but I had Dr. Alex George on the podcast yeah. recently. He's much younger than me. Um, and it seemed that it hadn't improved all that much. We were talking about eating disorders and how you very much taught the the stereotype is, is a young girl who's very underweight, who's, you know, at school and stresses of exams. And I think when we're taught about ADHD, it does tend to be more, both in the general population and within healthcare professionals, it tends to be, we think of a boy who's very hyperactive and sort of running around. Yeah. Um, and I think, when, again, autism, we tend to think of, of boys and we have that definition in our brains. And because we learn by pattern recognition, that's how we learn. When a person is sat in front of us who is presenting with issues but don't fit that pattern, and we're trying to find what the answer is, it was evident in your documentary, there was one girl in there who was doing some boxing yeah, Leanne. and she received so many different diagnoses yeah. throughout her life from anxiety to bipolar to personality disorders. Yeah. Um, and the relief that she shared when she found out actually she discovered autism and it was like kind of, it just all makes sense now. Yeah, again, unfortunately, it's extremely common. Uh, from the documentary, I've had thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of messages of women in particular, old women, that watched it and said, you know, I've, I've been diagnosed with depression, with bipolar, with everything, and I've watched a documentary, I'm almost there, and I'm autistic, and I'm none of these other things. Um, and, you know, if, if you are diagnosed with, with any of those other things, I think it's still important, and you get the help and support that you receive. But if you're actually autistic and not that, then whatever treatment you're being given is, mm. is not going to work. And, and the thing is, you know, as, as, as Leanne, you said, as she rightly highlighted... Um, a lot of the medications and treatments for conditions like bipolar, whilst if the person does have bipolar and they're effective, are worth it. They yeah. have a lot of side effects as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. She um, she described having it put her heart into an abnormal rhythm, and she had to go to hospital multiple times. So it is, it really is important that as healthcare professionals, we are always thinking about autism in women and girls yeah, in the same way perhaps we do and I men think and boys. not only the treatment and like the, the medication or the therapy or you know whatever help and support they can give that that's extremely important but also the environment and the place that it's given mm -hmm. you know for a lot of the ladies that I spoke to um Fee was another one she had anorexia yeah. she'd always struggled to get better and and now she's on this other program where the food is more suitable for her she's treated in a place that's more suitable for her she's seen at home you know instead of in a hospital where for someone who's autistic she was struggling with the change with being in a different environment with different nurses coming in and out um not seeing a family she was away from home and the same for leanne you know it's again it's it's just going to make them worse yeah but you can't blame the doctors and nurses if they didn't know yeah that they've gone along with the the normal program that they've been told to follow yeah for somebody who's who's got an eating disorder or somebody who's got bipolar yeah not for somebody who was autistic which is why unfortunately they they were failed um until they got the diagnosis and now they're, they're doing really really well yeah because I guess it's the same as what you experience. We make assumptions about people with eating disorders and we maybe encourage them to eat a range of foods that are low yeah. calorie but highly nutritious. And actually it's not about that. It's not about the weight. It's not about, it's about actually the textures that foods have yeah. and the colors of foods. And, you know, therefore actually, you know, within a certain, there's a certain range of foods that you may be happy to, to eat, but they're not always available. And that's what, but then it, you know, but then it, as, as in your case that's how it started but then it can become a more significant issue and yeah you lose control and of it and you know you, your tummy does shrink and you get used to eating less and then it, it becomes such a big issue the more people mention it kind mm. of doesn't help either um so it did spiral for me but you know again it, it led to a positive with my children where I had this different outlook on, well, as long as they're eating, as mm -hmm. long as they're healthy, that's what's more important. And yeah. I remember having 
health visitors, professionals, paediatricians, even family saying, oh, well, you're just, you're letting them eat what they want. Why are they going to go and eat what everybody else is eating if you're allowing them to eat breadsticks for breakfast and, and not, a, you know, a, a porridge? But I, I saw my children getting smaller. My son in particular really, really struggled. Um, he was in the hospital far too often when he was three, four, um, extremely underweight. We spoke about putting a peg in his tummy to feed him because he was so underweight. And it was all because I was following advice of what professionals had told me to do, was to only offer him food what all the other children were eating at nursery. And he he wouldn't touch it, he wouldn't eat it. And because I understood that, because I would sit there and look at this ball of bolognese and go, well, I'm in my 30s and I wouldn't eat it. It's far too sloppy, it's wet, it's got all these different colours, it it smells, I I wouldn't touch it, so why would I expect my children to eat it? So I kind of ignored their advice and and gave them anything beige, lots of high calorie stuff to get his weight up. Um, I got him milkshakes that had vitamins and extra calories in to make sure he was getting some nutrition in him. But ultimately it comes down to just being, you know, healthy enough to survive to live and and to thrive of course yeah. not just sticking to what people yeah. will say you must eat five a day five a day is amazing if you can but if you have got a sensory eating disorder yeah, yeah. It, you know it's, it is literally it's a matter of life or death when it comes to it you've got to just let your children eat what they will eat yeah well you obviously you're an absolute picture of health and you know we spread this message that we have to have this widely varied diet and eat the rainbow and all these colors but you've said actually you your preference is you mostly eat beige food that's yeah. dry in texture and obviously you can thrive what what sort of things do you eat and do you, do you take vitamin supplements I do to top of course up? I do um so for me of course I wish I could eat you know the five a day I really mm. do it, it looks lovely on a plate when I see it all like a rainbow it looks pretty yeah. um but I've just accepted that for right now that's not going to happen I want to keep pushing myself but I just want to stay healthy and keep my weight off yeah um so I'm on quite a high calorie <laughs> diet I have lots of carbs I have yeah. lots of pasta lots of bread um protein I have I have a lot of chicken so although it's very ble- like beige and bland yeah. for most people really boring for me it, it works and, yeah. and I'm a healthy weight yeah. and I've got enough energy to keep going and look after my children and and right now that's that's my focus and I admire you because you're a fitness bunny as well aren't you you, do, train, you train practically every day <laughs> not anymore um three four times a week okay I try and train yeah do yeah. something I'm struggling with my motivation as someone who's always trained at the moment I'm really struggling with motivation so um it's another reason I admire you <laughs> <laughs> um so I guess bringing it back to the ADHD we sort of went back into autism there and getting away from this I think we do need to get away from this stereotype yeah. this this image that we have and we do have a professional who's going to join us in a little while to to share a bit more about us but in your scenario do you feel that the autism and the adhd go hand in hand then yeah definitely for me it does anyway um and i can kind of tell now when i'm having more of an adhd day mm. um okay. I, yeah i can kind of separate it to days where i'm i'm feeling extremely autistic my, my autistic days are more so um, when I'm working or if I'm going to an event where it's a busy environment or if there's been a big change in life or if I'm, I'm doing something that I'm not quite prepared for, I admit my autism kind of takes over and I do go very insular, very into myself, very quiet, kind of hide in a corner. Um, whereas when I'm having quite an ADHD day, that's when I'll kind of notice more like details and things will will make me a bit more like more more anxious I'm more on edge I'm more right. yeah I, I feel everything a lot more than um than on me my typical autism days where I'm very much like just keep yourself to myself and nice and quiet and so do you feel like if kind of the, the situation feels comfortable for the autism that's when the ADHD yeah. can sort of bubble up yeah yeah the, I think the ADHD is triggered more by like bigger things that were, they're going to give me like anxiety and stress and things like that so and then I'll be more more hyper more vocal more yeah. on edge it's yeah, yeah I don't really like that side as much as the autism I kind right, of okay. keep myself quieter and yeah to which myself. is today <laughs> today today um today just more 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 calm more autistic this is I was prepared for today and yeah. I got the the questions the call sheet I knew where I was going um 
yeah, I'm I'm having quite a calm day today. I'm feeling Good. I'm feeling all right. Because I was another thing, just sat here having this conversation. Um, people watching and listening won't know, but we're in we're in a studio. There were quite a few people around. Um, we did just before we started recording where everybody introduced themselves a little bit and you mentioned about your short-term memory that yeah. that's another side of autism yeah. that people might not realize yeah yeah it's it's awful and it's always been there it's always been an issue and again growing up people are just go oh she's really forgetful it's christine she's forgot again yeah. and um but yeah it, it is it is actually very very common the more i speak to autistic women in particular the short-term memory is is not great, but then I can repeat a whole conversation with every single detail what I had last week yeah. and I'll go over and over it. I talk to myself a lot anyway, and yeah. I always have done, and I didn't realize that that was something that not everybody's on yeah. um, until I started talking to more autistic people. But yeah, I'll I'll remember things from years ago, from months ago, but yeah, this short-term memory is, yeah, not great. It's It's because I think I've been thinking this morning, I've been sort of, preparing to have this conversation with you and I think trying to figure out perhaps a little bit more what because the world is just it's slightly different your experience of where we are right now is I'm aware is different yeah to mine so I think just being a bit more aware today when I walked into this room I was aware that it does smell there is a I wouldn't have even noticed but there's quite there is a, a smell yeah. of, of food. It's food, um, yeah. Uh, actually, I walked in with a poke bowl and thought, actually, I'm not going to eat that. It's in the fridge. I thought I'll eat it afterwards because the last thing you need to be hit with is a smell of raw fish. Um, but even I, I noticed when you came in the room, and I kind of I guess I don't take that much notice of things, but you really do take notice. Yeah, yeah, and because I'm more aware of it now, I'll try harder. So throughout this, I'm, I've tried to really keep good eye contact. Yeah. But with you, it's quite easy because you've got dark eyes. If you have bright blue okay. eyes, I probably would keep looking away and having right. a glance. And, and I do, I still do look away, but I'll be more subtle. But I'm yeah. choosing to look that way and not that way because that way there's a shelf behind you full of plants. And oh, yeah. <laughs> so I would start counting. Right. I already have, I know yeah. there's 10 on there. Yeah. Well, well I was wondering, because when you were saying also with the with the ADHD and it's the sort of inattention, but in that moment when you said that, I thought, but I feel like I've got your full attention. So we've been chatting for, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes and I felt like I've had your full attention. But is that, is that hard? Is that work for you? Is that, are you having to yeah, like, really work yeah, hard to do that? Yeah, no, you haven't had me full attention. Oh, well, not. Way at all. <laughs> okay. so, you know, you fooled me. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm really trying and I will yeah. always try when I'm talking to someone. I want to mm -hmm. be present and I want to yeah. listen and I want to take it in and, and I want to enjoy the moment. But yeah. I'm always, no matter what, I'm always having five or six conversations in my head. Right. It's like there's a radio on and I can't switch it off right. and it switches between the channels and I'll start thinking about things that I've done last week or what I'm doing next week. And it, it's, it's hard, it's yeah. hard to really stay focused. But when I'm talking about autism or ADHD or my children, that's when I can hold a conversation compared yeah. to if we were just out now chatting, like we met at an event recently, yeah. if, we, if we just stayed chatting around a table about anything other than this topic, I'd, I'd have probably left by now because right. I'd have struggled to have kept that going. Right. But talking about things that I know about, I'm quite yeah. comfortable. Good. Okay. Well, I'm glad we're talking yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what What changes would you like to see when it comes to neurodivergence generally um, around people's ability to get a diagnosis? Yeah, I, care, I would say that. Treatment. Yeah, yeah. The diagnosis for children, I think it's so important. It makes a huge difference. If mm. they're diagnosed preschool, that's, that's incredible. They're going to get help and support early when they need it. But unfortunately for a, a lot of children, that diagnosis isn't coming until later on in life. It, it can be when they finish school, a, a lot of the waiting lists now are between four and seven years. Um, which means, you know, hundreds of thousands of children all over the country yeah. going without support that they need. And that is, it, it's it's a lack of funding. It's a lack of doctors being able to actually give that diagnosis, even mm -hmm. doctors that recognize it and they can say to the parents, yes, we believe your child is autistic. They're not actually able to go and do the whole assessment and give them a formal diagnosis. Therefore, they might not get the support that they need. Yeah. So I think somehow that does need to be brought right down. You know, nobody should be waiting for support, especially children. And it's the same, well, it's even worse for adults, isn't it? Because at the moment, have you, have you, you've had all these women reaching out to you after you made the documentary, yeah. probably saying, you know, I'm pretty certain that I have 
autism and it'd yeah. be a similar scenario with it for ADHD. Um, what have you advised them? To keep going, to keep pushing, don't don't leave it. Um, I think, again, one of the worst things someone can say to a, a woman in particular who's going for a diagnosis later on in life is, oh, well, you've got this far, so you must be fine. Mm. Do you really need that diagnosis? Mm-hmm. Does it matter if you're in your 30s and you've you've had a job and you've had a family, you've been married? Does it, does it make any difference? But it really, really does. From my own experience, it's completely changed my life. I'm doing so much more now since my diagnosis. I understand myself so much more. I understand people and the world so much more than I ever did. And I just, I didn't get it before I, I stayed in. I was a recluse for almost eight years. I, I barely left the house. I, I wouldn't be doing the events and the jobs and the, the stuff that I'm doing now if I did not have that diagnosis. So it's, it is very, very important. It so it's doesn't the quality of life age. thing, isn't it? Your, yeah. The quality of life you can have, it yeah. sounds like can be completely different. Yeah. Just knowing and understanding, yeah. having that diagnosis so you can sort of reevaluate everything I yeah guess. yeah definitely um I'd, I'd say to anybody to just keep pushing I know it's hard but just don't give up because you deserve that clarity yeah, yeah. you know you deserve to know that you're not going mad you're not overthinking anything here if, if you're feeling that you fit that yeah. bracket then go for it and get it clarified completely from the doctor sort of stepping out out of that for a moment thinking about public health and you know public health strategies what do you think fundamentally what do you think needs to change when we're talking about these types of topics I think a lot of it is quite simple changes and not expensive like where you know going into work or going into you know a a family function anyway even coming in here today you quite simply said can everyone introduce themselves so and, and for me it's nice to know who's in the room and what everybody does that that costs nothing it took mm. two minutes of your time to do that yeah. but it made me feel a lot calmer and and I know what's going on and getting the information before I got here things like that is really really helpful but that could happen in in everybody's everyday life if you know if if there's somebody working in a job where they don't want to eat in the canteen for them to be able to just speak to the boss and and just ask is is there somebody else that you know can I eat me my lunch away from everybody I'm not being rude but that could really help someone's mental health to just have that time away to just breathe to to step away and be allowed to do that without feeling rude or like they're being difficult it's it's a simple ask but it's a really really big difference for somebody who may struggle in that kind of environment it's that it's that understanding isn't it it's again it's what about what podcast is about you know what we're all learning from you um having that understanding and therefore empowering somebody who is affected to ask for just these simple things yeah. like please don't assume i'm rude just because yeah. actually i feel more comfortable yeah sitting in a different room to eat on my own yeah. or you know i just need to take 10 minutes out just to sit but again it was myself. only after my diagnosis that i felt confident enough to do that because yeah. i'd got to the point where i was turning down work i was turning down birthday parties wedding invitations everything i wouldn't go to anything and it was after my diagnosis that um i'd done a tv show called the real full monty and that was the first time where i, I felt extremely autistic I, I felt everything was just was overwhelming it was all too much I, I stayed in different hotels for the first time i stayed with people i'd never met everybody seemed to just be chatting away and eating together and spending all day and night together and i was sloping off to my room whenever i could and it was kind of bubbling inside me and i, I just went to to one of the other cast members duncan from blow oh yeah um who's your, who's your best he's, he's, yeah <laughs> we're very close um and yeah it was it was him that i spoke to and and i just said look i'm i'm autistic i'm really struggling to fit in here i, yeah. I don't know what to do and he he was amazing and took me under his wing and and then from there i went on to do another tv show which was a bigger group of people a bigger challenge it was for itv called the games the games and then so I'd, honestly well, i don't know how you're so brave but with that one i just went into the canteen <laughs> on the first day everyone was eating and i just went I'm not being rude everyone but I'm not going to eat with you at all <laughs> I'm autistic I, I, I love you all but I'm going to take my food and go and eat in my car and they were like oh fine yeah do what yeah. you want and by the end of it we were all eating together that's amazing so, yeah. that, but the, diff- the difference in the first time you felt so uncomfortable and afraid and you needed yeah. Duncan there to sort of um, you know I guess have those conversations yeah. for you 
to being so empowered to go in and say, no, just this is me, it. this yeah. is what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. It's not be- got anything to do with you, actually. Yeah. Um, and that's that. Yeah. yeah. And everyone's great. It, it is amazing that when you, do, when you do speak up and you ask for those little bits of help and explain, everyone's so understanding yeah. and so kind. Like, I think it's more in your head, the worry and the fear of making yourself seem difficult or, you know, coming across as being rude or unsocial. It's more up there you know that when you when you just say it, actually everyone doesn't really care and they're just like yeah do what you want everyone's in their own world to some extent aren't they but it is that thing of of fitting in and i think you know this is i think it's it's one of many many plausible reasons why girls and women um are so much better at masking when they have autism from being very little as girls we're trying to fit in we're trying yeah. to you know we don't want to be the one necessarily standing out we're trying to conform to what society tells us we should be which yeah. is usually perfect yeah boys t- are brought up to be brave and girls are brought up to be perfect there's a really great ted talk on that um and and i guess as somebody with autism that that's been your life hasn't it you've been constantly trying to trying to fit, fit in, in and, and never quite fitting in <laughs> yeah there was some of the language in the documentary where um both you and is it fee the girl yes, who had the fee. eating disorder we often spoke about trying to get it right like you know having a yeah. conversation you'd rehearse a conversation and if you felt like you didn't get the conversation right then it would ruminate in your mind yeah. and you know for me as somebody who doesn't have autism I don't necessarily think about getting a conversation right. I can have a good conversation or a bad one and come away and think, oh, I wasn't on form or I wish I hadn't said that. But to define a conversation as right or wrong, but that's that's been your your experience. Yeah, forever. I've, I've always wondered right through school. I'll, I've always gone over questions and conversations I've had. I always wonder if I've answered something correctly, as in... Not like as though I'm I'm being interrogated and I might have said it wrong. Yeah. It's more just simply, did did they say a joke and did I laugh at the right time or did they mean it sarcastically or were they being serious? Yeah. So it's things like that that I struggle to understand and yeah. yeah, I misunderstand quite a lot. And but now again, now I understand myself. I can kind of laugh at it and go, oh, well, I didn't hear it like that. It, yeah. it was completely different how I processed it. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's hard to understand people. I don't get that gut feeling on on how somebody may be and I try and take everybody at face value and I see everyone for the best and yeah, yeah and, and that's just me how I am. Well I guess I guess the different we were talking about this again before we started recording um and we talk about often that that gut feeling or you know I've been told before that I'm a good sense of character because I can I don't know the, the stuff that you, a person presents you with a certain amount of evidence but being a good sense of character is almost when you can read between the lines and and figure out who a person is beyond How what they're presenting you with that? you. And that and you were saying that, you know, a gut feeling, you don't even know what that no. really is because that's just something that you don't have. Yeah, I, d- I don't get it. And people, people often say to me, well, you know, just go with, surely you must have like a good judge of character yeah. or something. I'm like, well, no, not really. I don't, I've never really kept a lot of people in my life my circle's very very small yeah. like you know I've only got like uh, two or three very very close friends and and I rely on them a lot you know and it's it's not really their job to do what they do but my me, me closest friends in particular Kath is usually want, the one to say just just watch out for that or just be careful of yes, that I don't yeah. ever see people's intentions and that's something that um and I, I really don't like about myself because it you know things can happen over and over again and and I don't see it coming and then I'll get annoyed with myself that you know I, I should have learned by now um but it's again unfortunately quite quite common for autistic women in particular to be that bit more vulnerable a bit yeah. more innocent easily led a bit green and sort of believe anything and and I am very much that person yeah um, yeah, it's it's frustrating because still in my thirties, I, I don't learn and I don't see it coming when I might have seen it a hundred times. Yeah, but you know that's it's it's like you say that's part of what being autistic is, isn't it? And yeah. you shared in the documentary that um, you know, like you say, in some ways it can make you more vulnerable yeah. because you don't necessarily see those warning signs, those red flags. Um, but also, you know, you mentioned you, you're separated from your husband now, but yeah. perhaps it's one of the reasons why you you felt safe and that's yeah. why perhaps you stayed in a marriage that you know maybe other people wouldn't have done for a very long time yeah. because 
that sa- safety you don't like change and it's it's difficult yeah yeah and also believing that somebody would change mm. and and believe in it and believe in it and then they don't mm. and it's kind of you know like I said before that frustration within myself for believing in it mm. um but I still always want to believe that there's good in everyone and yeah. I want to believe when people say that they'll change but yeah I've I was married for 12 years um with Patrick for 16 years so from when I was 19 that's been my whole life and that's what I know so of course changes with that are, are petrifying yeah um we're doing everything very very slowly not just for me but for the children as well yeah, we yeah, still live together mm-hmm. um yeah and and eventually it is going to change because that's not a long-term plan but the thought of it does does petrify me it doesn't excite me i think most people think well you know surely you must be ready to move on now i get asked all about dating and things like that and i'm yeah. like no absolutely not i'm no. petrified i don't yeah. oh god i don't like eating in restaurants i don't know what food's on the menu don't really want to talk to someone that i don't know yeah. <laughs> like oh, and d- dating is absolutely <laughs> petrifying yeah. anyway, i've so totally rehearsed conversations when i back <laughs> yeah. in the days of dating i hated it but yeah so um yeah slow changes are good yeah, um, and there's no need to ru- there's no need to rush that yeah, stuff. I'm it? I'm not in any rush. I'm I'm really not. And, you Although know. I bet there's a lot of people interested. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I mean what you uh, sort of towards the end of the documentary, the bit there's one scene of you where I think having the diagnosis and being able to look back and reflect on life differently there's one scene where there's a particular sequin dress that you're getting rid of and you're going through your wardrobe and realizing actually I I didn't wear that because I wanted to wear that that's actually not me I wore that because I was trying to fit in and I think the sequin dress you were you were going on to um strictly yeah I wanted to look like everybody else yeah you wanted to fit in where actually you don't like scratchy textured clothes yeah you you like so so that journey of you know before moving on and being in another relationship it's, it's really about discovering the relationship I think with yourself isn't it yeah and yeah I've figuring got out to. I've now got you're not pretending anymore well yeah. we all pretend but you know now you're focusing on discovering who you really yeah. are how's that going I'm trying to not pretend but I still do it <laughs> well I think we all we all do to be honest yeah, but, yeah. but you obviously have done in a in, in, an in a different way, way. Yeah. yeah um which which I'm not doing anymore but I, I still do tend to try and fit in with you know wherever I'm going or whoever I'm with um but yeah it's it, I'm not really sure it, it's very contradictory being autistic because a lot of the things I do where it's trying to be like everybody else and trying to copy although that's not my authentic self it it is because it's, that is it's been the way you've lived your whole life. Yeah. So trying to stop that would not be me being yeah. myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, so it's it, it's hard, but I'm getting more comfortable in my own skin. Yeah. Um, I'm doing a lot more. I'm pushing myself a lot more. I'm, I'm saying yes to opportunities and I'm trying to not be so scared of change yeah. and know that everything will be fine. And I'm trying to just set a good example for my children. You know, I want them to grow up and be social and, and go to work if they want to and have families if they want to. And, and I want to show them that, you know, mummy does all of these things. And yeah, yeah a little bit silly sometimes. Um, <laughs> I usually end up in tears if I push myself too much, but yeah. I usually end up feeling proud and, and I want them to go and do all of that. Well, I honestly, you're. I just think you're so brave you're such an incredible mother. Your children are so, so lucky oh, to have you, you as their mum. And, you know, I am in admiration. <laughs> um, but one thing I'm desperate to ask you about, and I've waited till the end, is, yeah, so you did the, the Real Full Monty, which is yes. a show I did as well, um, which was kind of terrifying in so many... They made us do it on ice, though. They made us ice skate. Which, so you know, my fear with that, people misunderstood, it wasn't so much taking the clothes yes. off. Of course, that's petrifying. Yeah. My problem was the audience and the noise and the light and the smell it was performing in front of a huge audience for me that's what I found petrifying yeah because I remember you went on Loose Women and spoke about it and it's yes. Brenda Edwards who's yeah. just lovely yeah and you know her fear and lots of the women who do that show it's about actually bearing yourself bearing to an audience up, yeah. um but for you you it were terrified just it was being in a room with fears. people yeah <laughs> Um, so you did that, then you did the games, which involved yeah. you diving from a high board and you were scared oh, of gosh, heights. Oh yeah. <laughs> Again, I'm scared of heights, that terrified me. Um, 
but you've just done Celebrity Hunted. I have. How yeah. was that? It was amazing. Honestly, the best thing out of everything I've ever done. Um, it's where I've been my most comfortable, my most confident, even though I was petrified of everything, because I'm in this mindset now of really wanting to push myself. I said yes, and I just went for it. I went for it, I enjoyed it. Um, I was with Duncan, thank God, who yeah. I'm very close with. Um, and that helped massively. I think what I've learned about myself is that if I'm with someone that I know, that I trust, that I'm comfortable with, I can do so much more yeah. than if I'm on my own or if I'm with people that I don't know, then I'm, I'm definitely more likely to kind of sit in the corner and take myself away and yeah. stay quiet. So yeah, having that right support system is really, really important for me. Yeah, great. Um, and what have you got coming up? Obviously, please tell us about your book as well and anything else you've got coming up. I am writing another children's oh, book. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Um, my last one went to number one on World Book Day. It done really well. Um, so I've just started writing again for my second one, which will be out next year. Um, and then I'm just trying to think if I'm allowed to say that. I don't think I'm allowed to say anything else. Okay, fab. Well, um, well, I can't wait for that. Thanks again. So we're going to take a short break now, and then we're going to be joined by our expert, and we're going to dig into things a little bit further. So we're now very lucky to be joined by Dr. Rajiv Dar, who is a consultant psychiatrist um, who actually runs an ADHD clinic um, and is based at the Cromwell. So thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you for inviting me. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience first, if you wouldn't mind, with, with psychiatry and autism and ADHD. Uh, well, I've been a consultant um, psychiatrist for 20 years, almost. Um, and what we do is we, we treat all types of mental health problems, actually. So we start with a mental health issue and then we drill down into what type of disorder it might be. Um, so in the course of my career, um, depending on the environment I've worked in, uh, it could be PTSD, it could be schizophrenia, it could be P ADHD. So we really specialise in actually diagnosing with diagnosticians. I work in the private sector, I work with, the, with corp a lot of corporate patients. I also deal a lot with individuals who are transitioning from child service to adult services mm -hmm. so university because it's a lifelong process yeah. uh, getting a diagnosis the journey of an ADHD patient is, is you know very similar actually uh, yeah. across the world so I deal with patients all over so um, my my job now is to make sure that we uh, are able to diagnose people who suspect they may have it um, mm -hmm. either because their children have been diagnosed or because they've always wondered whether there's something else going on. It's not just depression or anxiety disorder or any of these other conditions. So my job is to try and, like a detective, work that out. Okay. And I guess one of the things that's just sprung to mind is when we talk about autism, so we always talk about the autistic spectrum disorder and we, you know, we know that it is a spectrum and people can be affected to different extents. How do you feel about that word disorder? I, I mean, obviously for some people it's a very, very disabling condition. Mm -hmm. Um, for other people like you, Christine, you know, you, you live a really a, a life that many people would look up to and admire and love to have your life, but you've spoken about how actually every day has additional challenges. Yeah. It's hard work. It sounds like everything is a lot of additional work. But do we think disorder is right? I personally prefer condition, um, mm. but yeah it's it's different for everyone and if you've met one autistic person you've met one like you said yeah. you know there, there are those where it does affect them physically therefore it will be you know have, have disabilities as well yeah. um lots of people like to go with the abilities that they get yeah. um instead of but yeah for me it's it's simply that i am an autistic person mm -hmm. but i'm still i'm, I'm just a person who happens yeah. to be autistic well sometimes people talk about that don't they the the abilities sort of the super abilities that yeah. can come with it, how often, Rajiv, do you do you come across patients who who have neurodivergent conditions that sort of see it as a, a benefit? It's a, it's a really a good point, an important point. Um, without a doubt, you know, we I will see a, an individual who has a condition. Like we said, there is there has to be a way of describing the pattern. Mm. So I agree with you completely. Condition is a better word <clears throat> that has dysfunction in some areas. So I use the word function for that individual, but also can, you know, hyperfunction. Mm. And whether you want to call it genius or abilities or whatever, it's the ability of that individual in that particular context, uh, you know, to, to, to overperform. Yeah. But the flip side, I guess, in terms of why we're trying to get people 
the support they need is that, that it will often go with an area that they don't perform as well in. Yes. Um, and that fitting in, uh, you. I mean, you both did a fantastic job, and exp- I mean, I, it was uh, it was inspirational to listen to the to the conversation because you you tapped on into all the areas as a senior consultant. I have to communicate with patients because that's what we see. We see this challenge of fitting in. So I agree that yes, no, it's it's definitely about uh, encouraging people to develop the areas that they already brilliant at and there's definitely individuals that have that but it's also making sure the other areas don't cause suffering yeah so yeah Rajiv would you reflect on the conversation that Christine and I had and were there any specific points that oh. when you were sat listening you thought oh I'd love to interject and add this or mention that <laughs> or? A fantastic conversation I mean I, I've <laughs> had you know listened to people talking about their their mental health issues for 30 years now and I thought that you described it just beautifully I mean, the notes are too extensive but I, I would say there's two or three things I would think need to come out from a professional is that you, uh, you I think you start at the beginning about talking about parenting and learning about yourself first of all learning that you may have ADHD and autism because of your children which is really interesting isn't it because it's 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 almost the, the gift that the children have given you mm. and some insight into yourself and then you've taken that and you've been able to create an environment which has allowed them to flourish now yeah so we don't need to we don't need to medicalize things. We don't need to make things psychological. We need to create environments, so that that minimizes the impact of any mental health condition. Your journey really started with the diagnosis. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah definitely. So that which is what I've always said that without that diagnosis being there and and getting over the barrier of seeking a diagnosis, um, you wouldn't have had this journey. No, I think you go through um, instantly, it's almost like a grieving process, or for me it was, you kind of grieve for the life what you, you could have had or might have had, or you know, and you sort of realise that things happen, certainly in my teenage years, that you know, might not have happened if I'd have had the help and support at the time, but it didn't, so you, you, have, you have a bit of a grieving period, but then you, you get this rebirth. And it's it's like you have got this whole new life where you suddenly understand it a bit more and you understand yourself more. And it's it's incredible for me. It's been a huge positive getting that diagnosis. So I think we're all agreed that the diagnosis bit is absolutely crucial. But then we have an issue, don't we? Because I think, you know, we through your documentary alone, it's raised a lot of awareness. And we know that there yeah. are many, many women and men, adults mm. out there, mm. who will now be thinking that they have autism. Um, but as an NHS GP, when patients come to me and ask me to help them get the diagnosis, we're a bit stuck because mm. we don't, we don't, we're not able to, essentially, for, for adults. In, it, may, it may depend on where you are in the country, but where I work in central London, um, we're not able to to refer for that so what do we do so what what I guess what can people do obviously there's the option of, of private seeing seeing somebody like yourself Reggie privately which I think perhaps for a lot of people it is worth it you know if, if they can but for people who absolutely can't you can go online there are these self-assessments that you can do online um, but what would be the pros and cons of doing that well, I think I think uh, let's distinguish self-assessment from self-diagnosis. Uh, that's an important distinction, isn't it? So, self-assessment um, uh, could lead to self-diagnosis, but if anything, it should lead to a diagnostic process that then is valid. Uh, if you have self-assessment and then self-diagnosis, then obviously we're going to have false positives, false negatives, uh, and that's not going to help anything because mm. you're creating a whole new set of Health economic issues. Um, so if we if we use screening tools correctly, then we can get that first step where people are filtered a bit before they go on to the diagnostic step. The diagnostic step is a problem, as you say. Mm-hmm. As a GP, you know, I, I've always said that you know when I was a clinical director, we always had this uh, challenge of how what can you do in a five or ten minute consultation. And we can't we can't to keep the, the private sector aside. We can do a, more on understanding that consultation better. For people who have mental health problems, because we we need to be efficient with it, uh, and then I think, as, as you said, you know, how do you then get that valid diagnosis in place? Because it has to be it has to be a psychiatrist, and it has to be a psychiatrist who's had specific yes, training in yes. making these uh, diagnoses. And, and, and there's really important reasons because it, you know, as as we've said, there are two 
the two bits of ADHD that go together. One is ADHD itself and what it, uh, how it manifests. And you've said it very well, actually, about the overlap with other conditions like autism. And there's a 40% chance that a person will have autism as well as ADHD. Yeah. And if you add dyslexia into that and dyspraxia, you've got that mix. And then you've got very high morbidity connected to ADHD. So social anxiety, we're talking 80%. Yeah. And then moodiness. So it's a complex disorder mm. whenever anybody yeah. presents. That's why it has to be done by a diagnostician who understands all those different conditions. Uh, and then the pathway can be set, you know, the pathway can include other people and it can be more efficient. But I think that first step is important. That diagnosis has to be a, a proper formulation. So what needs to happen then? I guess from a, I asked Christine this question, kind of looking at it more from a public health perspective, from a um, government perspective, from NHS England, you know, with commissioners, what, what do you think? needs to happen to better support people in this very but this is just getting the diagnosis i mean i think we're at a point where if we have uh, cost medicine if we have conditions that we think are root causes we invest in that yeah so if you take adhd as being one of those root cause conditions that has secondary conditions and there are other ones in medicine as you know uh, we invest in that and we we you know we prioritize it, it takes time to build a system around. We prioritise that because it's the second effect will be cost saving anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think yes, no, that, that's that's got to be the post. So the, the 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 interest isn't going to go away mm. because you know ADHD and autism is out there now. Yeah. I don't think you know we know globally anything anything between four and seven percent pre COVID. Yeah. And I would say COVID is because of for lots of reasons. We don't have time to discuss it, but COVID is also probably increased um, uh, the symptomatology with ADHD. Mm. Uh, it's, you know, it's untapped it a bit. So you've got a higher percentage, so it's not going anywhere. Um, yeah. So we do, we do need to find a solution to this. Yeah, time. So uh, yeah, so that point about the um, uh, primary care, how can we be more um, robust in finding a pathway for patients? Yeah. So I think, like I said, the initial, the initial consultation has to be uh, I think a uh, one that includes in its in the GP's mind all the possible diagnoses. So without any stereotyping or because as you said, it's exactly the same thing we had with long COVID, where you know GPs would often find it difficult to think that this could be long COVID. Mm. So it would delay the diagnosis. It would delay the process. So with ADHD, it's exactly because the there's same. something in your mind saying because you've got almost like your your aim is to prove that it's not that thing rather yeah. than looking to prove that it, it is, is it that is, thing. It is, it and is, I think ADHD and autism in females, your brain, you're not choosing to, but your brain automatically, for some reason as a doctor, is thinking, well, it can't be that, so let's disprove yeah. it. And it's it's quite hard. It, it's it, if I mean, this is a difficult one. You don't want to necessarily show this, but, but it's difficult in 10 minutes mm. to explore something that you know you can't possibly... It is, but we always have the benefit we can bring people back. So I think, you know, the 10 minute well, consultation in general well, that's, practice that's is restrictive. Issue. That's the issue. Um, and we've got a real shortage of appointments. But I think sometimes, certainly what, what I may have done with patients is say, go away, have a little read of that, do the self scoring, and then come and then back come and, back and, have, and let's look have at another it. So I think you can, you can do it. Sometimes you, keeping a little diary. Yeah, you can, do a serial, you can do serial kind of consultation. So if it's 15 minutes over whatever, 10 minutes. 10. But, over, but we can book a double as well. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do it over, over three, four months, this is mm. a person who may, who's had this for th 20 years. Yeah. On average. Mm. Plus, so it's not, you know, if they know there's a process by which we're going to get to a bit closer to identifying. Mm. And then, you know, what we then need is a, is a diagnostic assessment in place. Yes. But it's not it's not going there because also as you said there is there is still this idea that you know uh, people carry with them an idea so it's the same with all conditions with cancer mm. unless somebody looks like their weight loss and all the rest of it mm. you will you won't you know you you will kind of look of look at things that are simpler yeah with ADHD you will generally not think about somebody who has ADHD if they've got an attention problem mm. because the attention problem is like you said you have to share how you process information yeah if you were hyperactive on the on the seat it would be a bit more obvious yeah if you were interrupting the gp every second the gp would say well actually possibly this is adhd yeah so it depends on what type of ADHD you have yeah. yes and that's that's a challenge with this is that there's there's because doctors are just human they always have a they'll have their own template in their mind yeah they'll be thinking well that's adhd in my mind this mm -hmm. can't be adhd mm -hmm. but we, when we take when we take adults we know that hyperactivity reduces over age 
So mm-hmm. when when you when you're a little child, you'll have hyperactivity, inattention, impulsivity as norm. Mm-hmm. Because the frontal lobe of the brain hasn't developed. As you get older, the hyperactivity for those who are ADHD will eventually wear down. It'll wear off. What you'll get more of is inattention. Yeah, that's yeah. Where I'm at. So when you get to, when you get to GCSEs and A levels in university, so wherever the structure starts to go around you, the attention problem becomes more. So we, that's why we see adults with inattention mm. who didn't necessarily have the uh, hyperactivity. The impulsivity is an interesting one. So for most people with ADHD, as children, it will lessen, yeah. but there's a group, unfortunate group, that will go on into adulthood still with impulsivity. Okay. So the majority are going to be inattention as adults. Some within the impulsivity, but far less with hyperactivity. That's really damaging. Yeah. So that's why the, that's why the, it's very hard to to uh, be a detective and, and tease out that inattention mm. because someone says, "Oh, yeah, I did reasonably well at university. I'm working here. I'm working in a bank or whatever." You say, "Well, how can you possibly have inattention?" But you're, you describe the type of inattention issues mm. that you have to stay very focused. You, it yeah. takes you. 150 percent which means you're more prone to burn out and yeah definitely so i've got i've got <laughs> but that's that kind of what i've got from christine is just hearing you know an account even just staying in a hotel for him everything is a lot more requires a lot more yeah. effort is a lot more yeah. work yeah it, it sounds exhausting to be honest it is but be, again because i understand it now I'll, I'll plan better so i know if i've got a busy run for example if i'm uh, on a promotion run if I'm promoting a, a children's book or a documentary for example I know I've got a busy week full of interviews and podcasts and and I know now that after that I will burn out massively then I've got no patience I don't want to speak to anyone yeah. I want to stay very much on my own and it's not good for no one it's just it's not good for me it's not yeah. good for anybody else so now I, I space things out a yeah. lot more I, I manage mm-hmm. my time better I make sure that I give myself quiet time after I've done a job yeah. um, and it just means I can function better because if I shut down, then I'm, I'm no good to no one, yeah. <laughs> you know? So it's, yeah, it's just managing better now that I understand it. Um, but yeah, when you don't know what you're dealing with, then you, you're gonna keep, I used to have burnouts and meltdowns all the time and I still do, but since I understand it, I'm managing it a lot better. You could anticipate more now. Yeah, yeah, mm. definitely. Mm. Well, I think, you know, what we're doing right now, Christine's documentary, this sort of stuff that just raises awareness generally and helps people understand a bit more and hopefully be kinder and more sympathetic, but hopefully also helps um, raise the profile of how important it is and and where, you know, it's not really ethical that people are unable to get a diagnosis for these conditions. Do sometimes people challenge you and say, yeah, but you can't, be autistic can have ADHD because look at you, you've got it all together and you live in this, what appears to be like a, such a wonderful life and it is a wonderful life, but obviously with all these additional challenges. And how do you respond to that? I still think it's amazing how people don't get the, what I show is is a version that I'm presenting. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I, I still don't get it. And when people look at me Instagram, they'll see a, a one second photograph of me on a red carpet where I might be smiling and they'll go, oh, well, she's fine. Yeah. But they haven't seen the five hours before that of me having a meltdown or pacing up and down my room going, I'm not sure if I should mm. go or yeah. can anyone tell me what anyone else is wearing? And the millions of questions that I've asked before I've even got there. Yeah. And then they haven't seen me in a room where I'm, I'm stood looking over the balcony just seeing where the chair is and who I'm next to and, yeah. and leaving every 20 minutes because I need time out. No one sees all of that. Yeah. Even though I spoke about it so much, people will still go, but you went to that event and you smiled. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but I, I like to portray that yeah. I'm fine and yeah. I like to act comfortable and I like to not stand out. So I'm going to go and give me my best act and I can yeah. and, and try and fit in with everybody yeah. else. There's a bit in the documentary, the bit I thought, oh, I wish I could see where you said, you know, your happy place is actually when you're completely by yourself. Yeah. And yeah. even your husband, who you've been married to for many years, would be surprised if he saw who yeah. you were when you're just being you. Yeah. And I wish, oh, I want to see, but obviously I'm not going to get to see. I rearrange <laughs> things a lot. That's what I tend to do when I'm on my own, even in my bedroom at night or if I'm in a hotel, certainly I'll, I will rearrange stuff a lot. I'll mm. be moving plant pots around and pictures and, you know, moving blankets and cushions and handing them in a cupboard. And, and I tend to do a lot of rearranging of places, even in my own home. Yeah, when I'm on my own. <laughs>
Love it. Roger, back to you. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Is mm. there any, anything else you... I can see you've got loads of notes on your page there. <laughs> oh, it's your conversation. I mean. uh, <laughs> any, anything else that you'd like to pick out from what we were talking about that you, you could I mean, I think you... you uh, so, uh, from a clinical perspective, you've raised quite a few symptoms, I think, which, again, goes back to the conversation about uh, when people present with something to the to their GP or yeah. to their psychiatrist. And is it is it could it be connected to ADHD autism? So you mentioned something about sleep, yeah, which is what I'm quite interested in at the moment. Is that the, which is connected to overthinking? Yeah. So there's a vicious cycle where you said that you know, maybe when you're younger, but you something might happen. There might be an explosion, and then you regret it because you didn't really mean it. Yeah. And then it plays in your mind. Yeah. For the rest of the day, and then you can't. When nighttime happens, we we we've evolved. To always be more hyper vigilant at night since mm. we were you know in, in the in the jungles because that was when we were most at risk as human beings so our newer biology is is designed to be more vigilant so when everything's quiet and calm we will focus on things that bother us where we feel stress so these events then for someone with ADHD will result in them overthinking so how do I solve that because my insomnia has been going yeah on it's will it's lifelong but, 30 years. but I think again because we, we, we're going around with the same issues I suppose is that it's it's that diagnostic it's that understanding of first of all well you're not sleeping because you can't switch your mind off and then from that onwards you then have a plan that solves that bit yeah it's so if you could put your mind rest, it, is, it would be that so you're overthinking yeah well can I just say that every single word that has come out of your mouth today does not need to be analysed or... I know you'll still do it, but <laughs> it doesn't need to be analysed mm. or ruminated on because, Thank you know, you. as Rajiv said, like the way you've just described and explained to me and everyone listening, you know, just a little bit of what it's like to be in in your shoes, yeah. in your life. It's really, head. really helpful. <laughs> and I'm sure there'll be lots of people listening who have ADHD, who have autism, who will just feel seen and heard as well so thank you so much thank you for having me oh today. good and dr raji thank you so much as well just absolutely fascinating to hear me. you know a bit more about the the science and a clinician's perspective on it and again even though you haven't solved the problem of my issue as a gp knowing how <laughs> to help people quite um you know hopefully hopefully we will see change and i think conversations like we're having right now and your documentary christine literally as a single entity on its own um will really really hopefully help with that so thank you both thank you, oh, thank you. thanks for having us